Wow. Oh. So, I don't know, uh, doing anything for St. Patrick's Day? Uh, oh, yes, we are. Are the pipers busy? Yes, are the, they will are. the pipers be piping? Yes, they are. We're going to be leaving around 7 o'clock uh, Saturday morning and go to Utica to uh, perform in Utica St. Patrick's Day Parade. At the, at the conclusion of that, we're going to do the cannonball run and go down to Albany and play in the... Uh, I'll be seeing Patrick Wow, Day that's Day. like another 90, uh, 90 uh, mile ride. Yeah, it is. We got about two hours to make the run. So, we're Ooh, gonna, whoa. so <laughs> I, I would presume, though, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, 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 you'll be in toward the end of the parade. You've got two hours well, to get there, and you only well, got an hour and a half drive. <laughs> but, you know, being St. Patrick's Day, I, I would assume and also hope very much that all the troopers are going to be busy in these communities where the parades are and leave us alone on the tour. <laughs> you can, you can so hope so that. We can get there. You can hope that. Yeah, and then last uh, sun, uh, Sunday, we were down in Goshen for their St. Patrick's Day parade. Wow. They do theirs early, so the, the Pipers and everybody can go someplace else this weekend. And the next week, we'll go to Delhi to perform. Wow. And uh, mentioning Pipers, Mr. Bowen, yeah. we have for you the DVD of the entire oh. performance that you were not able to see. Well, yes, uh, my wife and I did go to the uh, uh, Scotia Glenville, the Scotia Glenville uh, pipe band uh, performance at the Scotia Glenville High School, uh, and uh, we had to leave at halftime. But what we saw was terrific. I mean, they really are good. They really are good. I saw your wife, and uh, she said she enjoyed watching you. All right, very good. Very good. Uh, come on, come on over. Sit down. Just got to lift these wires in there. Glenville thing here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, there we go. You're clear He's now. not as limber as he used to be, though. Okay. All right. I quite have. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything historically interesting uh, or significant happening in Amsterdam this week? Always. Oh. Any old news? <laughs> makes a history. Well, I've been walking around town trying to get a feel for uh, what it was like to walk around here with my hoodie up, flashing gang signs at everybody. I have to make them up. You got to move in a little bit. Nope. Very good. Uh, Either that or we just move the, we move the camera a little bit. I don't think that. Yeah, you're right. You're both okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Not having much luck, you know, historians aren't good for gang slogans. You know. well, like 5440 or fight. That's you know, right. Or, Give me liberty or death, it just doesn't work. But it's interesting. We settled at 49, though, right? We did. Yeah. 49th parallel, excellent movie. Yeah. Um, so we, did, we lost Vancouver in the process. Ah, but we, uh, we consolidated our claim on uh, Seattle. And <laughs> Puget's. Well, the NBA is thankful for that. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you can say that. But, you know, when you have a campaign slogan, 54-40 or fight, and then you don't get the 54-40 or fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Well, what, what was that? Uh, what was that little pie-shaped uh, piece on the Canadian border along the 49th that we picked up somewhere along the way? Remember that? One? That wasn't the Gaston purchase. Was no, that was on the south. That was on the south of Mexico. Yeah. Um, you might be thinking about Fort Blunder, which is at the top of New York. No, 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 no. This is uh, somewhere in the Midwest. Somewhere in the Midwest, to the uh, to the left of the Great Lakes, as you're uh, looking at the globe. Uh, it's not were, the Mississippi Range up yeah, there. Yeah, the yeah, there were, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I know a little. There's a little bump you're talking. That makes sense. It just goes off the 49th parallel for some reason. Right. Oh, I don't recall that. Isn't there a community? Partly in Vermont and partly in Canada, where the library is split between yes. the United States and Canada, and they have all sorts of rules in there, which side you can take books out of and which side you can't. <laughs> it's kind of like those bars when I was stationed at Fort Campbell, where the, the Kentucky-Tennessee line went right down the bar. And you, could, you could order a drink on this side of the house, but you couldn't drink it on the other side of the house. <laughs> In Wisconsin, I was in Superior, Wisconsin. They had bars that were put like that, but on one side you could order liquor, and the other side you could only get wine. There are some strange laws out there regarding the consumption of alcohol. Well, you can uh, you can thank the uh, 18th and the uh, 20th Amendment for that. The, uh, yeah, 20th, right? Yeah, the repeal. Yeah. 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 Uh, the Bolstead Act. Ah, the Bolstead Act, yes. There's an experiment that didn't work. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the last experiment they're trying to have. Yeah. 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 We're in one now that is not working. What? Progress is made by going backwards. No, that's what they say. Now, uh, I don't know, how familiar are you with uh, how New York got its boundaries? I, I used to have this down flat when I took the New York history course at Albany State, but that was some years ago. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, there, there is some dispute as to whether 
Massachusetts may have a claim to uh, part of the bed of Lake Erie. Uh, <laughs> well, no, actually, uh, Massachusetts uh, 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 may have a legitimate claim to part of that. Uh, the, the original colonial charter for Massachusetts Bay Colony pretty much gave it everything to the west. Right to the Pacific. It, that's right. Uh, all of those char original charters, Virginia, etc. Uh, uh, yeah, was uh, the granted uh, between this parallel and that parallel right. or whatever North to, to 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 the end of the continent, except where subject to the jurisdiction of a Christian prince, except for previously subject to the jurisdiction of a Christian prince. So in other words, it stops, uh, uh, the, the, the Massachusetts has that claim going west, but it stops, uh, or it's interrupted by the Dutch, uh, Dutch occupied New York, okay? Right. Uh, well, they didn't observe that very well, it was a constant... Well, yeah, 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 but, uh, but you know, that, that was an interruption. So New York eventually develops as its own state, and blah, blah, blah. But... New York didn't have a claim to the western part, which were Indian lands, the western part of the state, until, until after the Revolutionary War. And Massachusetts never really gave up its, uh, it, it gave up its claim to, to the Northwest Territories, but it never gave up its claim to the Bed of Lake Erie. But I thought there's superseding law in that when Congress agreed to accept the state's uh, Revolutionary War debts, one of, the, one of the buybacks for that, I mean, right. one of the deals, was that all states would give up the claims of the Western yes, territories. Yes, but, but that did not include, uh, the, Lake Erie was, uh, excluded from it, was not excluded, it just wasn't mentioned. <laughs> ah, but another principle of the, uh, of the Treaty of Paris, 1783, was that all lands that had previously belonged to the Crown reverted to the states or on the unorganized territories to the United States of America. That's true. So any inland marine waters would belong to the... Uh, well, except that... Uh, except I don't think it covered that. So, anyway, that's the claim. I don't know how true it is. Well, my, I always thought... We, we had to give up Erie, Pennsylvania along the way. Yeah. Which is uh, the only thing separating us from Ohio. Well, the biggest thing we gave up was Vermont. Well, that, that was kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Because we claimed, uh, in fact, uh, in well, the, yeah, it was part of it was part of New York, but yeah. it, uh, they they kind of seceded from us anyway. So uh, one of my favorites, so they finally just recognized uh, one of the. Uh, we almost went to war with them in uh, 1790, and the state militia was called out. Right. And at that time, our governor was George Clinton, who was the only New York governor to ever command troops in the field. New York troops in the field. He did in the Revolution on several occasions. And he was ready to go to war. <laughs> he was ready to go to war with, with uh, New Hampshire over Vermont. But it, uh, it came to pass. To this, to this day, uh, the Bennington uh, Battle Monument is in Bennington, Vermont. But the battle took place in New York. Oh, yeah. But it was because it was Vermont troops, uh, and, they, and they were claiming their own, uh, you know, their own statehood or their yeah. own independence. Uh, they, they refused to... Uh, yeah. Well, it's yeah. just like you know, the Battle of Saratoga really was not in Saratoga, it was over in the well, it was in the general area. <laughs> it was over in yeah, I mean, it wasn't in Saratoga right. Springs, but it was, it was at least in Saratoga Skyler County. County. <laughs> That's actually really funny because um, the you're right, it didn't happen in what we think called Saratoga. Uh, what we now call Saratoga was was basically you know, not called anything, but uh, it was called Stinky Water. <laughs> yeah. in the Indian language. Some people still call it that. Um, but the little village where the surrender actually occurred uh, decided that you know let's get into historical tourism, and they decided to call themselves Victory. And of course, nobody goes there now. They all go to the everybody goes to Saratoga for the turning point for yeah. have in August. So that, that, that's a, 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 a reach for tourism that didn't work. <laughs> but yeah, New York's got an interesting history of the water where its borders come from. And we started, we were mentioning before Port Wonder, which is a port the United States built uh, up by Rouse's Point in the early 1800s. And then we found out that we'd built it in Canada. <laughs> and there's been a surveyor, in fact, the surveyor's were supposed to be drunk. They were, they were paid in rum. <laughs> so, that, that would not have been George Washington, right? No. So they, they took a little on account, 
and they ended up uh, a, a goodly portion of the ports in Canada. So we had to negotiate with the Canadians to change, that's a little bump on our northern border there, <laughs> to change so that the port actually became you know, part oh, of the United States. Oh, okay. All right. That explains that bump. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Well, New York also has one of the very few places in the country where you can visit a uh, War of 1812 battlefield. Sure. Up on, uh, what's the name of the little village? Yeah. The Sackett's Harbor. Sackett's Harbor. Sackett's Harbor. Yeah. And it's a, we went up there a few years ago. It's a, first of all, it's a lovely little village. It is. And, uh, it's on, on Lake Ontario, and, uh, and they're... Their, their War of 1812 site is uh, very well laid out. Uh, you, get a, you get a good uh, good idea. And then you get uh, Plattsburgh, which is sometimes called the uh, first invasion or the last invasion, depending on how you want to count it, of the United States. Uh, the, uh, the British came across Lake Champlain and uh, we defeated them by land and by sea or by lake. I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, sort of. <laughs> well, well let's, while we're on the subject, let's drink a toast to the father of the American Navy, Benedict Arnold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not, not Amsterdam's Benedict Arnold, the, the other, other Benedict Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, uh, the other, you know, Amsterdam's Benedict Arnold became a major general in the War of 1812, as you know. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, I always assumed that he was named after the hero, Benedict Arnold. I didn't realize he was named after the hero, Benedict Arnold, about two weeks before Arnold betrayed his country. <laughs> You'd think they would have changed his name before he went to kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I, I, don't, I don't think living here, we have as much appreciation for the history that we have in New York State that we should. I was teaching um, Indian history in Wisconsin, and the guy, the professor I was working with was from uh, California, and his concentration in, in, for his PhD was uh, colonial American history up through uh, 1850 or something. He did a lot with the fur trade in the American Revolution. And I just couldn't envision how somebody from California could have an understanding of what really took place here, how it was, and how things developed, any more than we can probably really have a true understanding of what took place, you know, in, in uh, the, the Mexican Southwest of the United States. Because not living there, you just you just don't see it. You can read it, but you don't see it. Mm -hmm. Yet what took place here is, is so vitally important to American history. You know, whether it's, you talk it's the Mohawk Valley or the yeah. Hudson Valley or, or, or going, going, up, going up north. It's the Harry Valley. Yeah. Cherry Valley. Yeah, that's why Absolutely. they call New York the Empire State, because here the fate of empires was decided. I thought it was the Empire State because we had baseball. <laughs> yeah, but that didn't get involved. Well, didn't oh, involve yeah, Empire. I kept thinking it's Empire all these years. <laughs> Mm, all right. Uh, uh, John Ford's uh, epic uh, uh, Drums Along the Mohawk was on last night. I, I watched it for the first I time in years. It. I didn't see it ever. It was on TCM. Uh, it, it was a prime movie. That was absolutely fabulous uh, movie. You know, uh, General Herkimer comes off pretty well. And Edna May Oliver. My <laughs> God, was there ever a better character actress than Edna May Oliver? <laughs> Well, and you know she's playing this old pioneer widow. Yeah. Well, you know whose husband had been a general or something. Yeah, the Indians come. And the Indians come into her bedroom, and she just you, get, you know you just get out of here. And it's like you know, like Adelaide Putniak at the when the bingo game got robbed. And, uh, <laughs> but it was just the the the, uh, the robber points a rifle in her face and she pushes it aside. Don't you point guns at people? Somebody might get hurt. <laughs> There's a, there's a famous story about uh, the, one of the interminable uh, French and Italian wars in Europe, and when the two armies were approaching, the uh, French officer walked out to the Italian officer, and the Italian officer went to go over, grab his sword, and the French officer said, how dare you, shield your sword immediately, and he did, and the war never got started. <laughs> well, there's a... There's a World War II, World War II story of a guy from Amsterdam. Uh, it's, in, it's in both of my books. Uh, paratroops in with was the 101st Airborne on D-Day. He lands, and here's a scared young German soldier standing there 
with his gun in his hand, just staring at, at this American dropping down from the sky. And the uh, guy from Amsterdam looks at him and says, Scram! <laughs> and the guy took off. And, and the reason for that was, I mean, you say, why didn't he just shoot him? Because they were under orders, under no circumstances, in, in, engage in any, any, any fights until you've organized until you've uh, until you've at least got a platoon or uh, or, or better organized uh, so because if you if you start shooting then it tips everybody else off that you're there yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunately he was later later killed a couple of months later uh, I think at the Battle of the Balls I'm not sure but, uh, right, that's a great movie, uh, Drums Along the Mohawk. Oh, yeah. I, I can watch that over and over again. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I've been reading, uh, I'm still reading Teddy Roosevelt's Winning of the American West, toward the end of volume three. And, and he really gets it right, and he gets he gets the flavor of it down good. I mean, those, those Indian wars were absolutely vicious. Uh, and it, you know, you yeah, they just come come through and uh, wipe out your family, and uh, you come home, and uh, all your kids are dead, and uh, your wife uh, wife is uh, off with a uh, adopted by one of the Indians. And, you know, holy mackerel! Thank you. And it was just everyday life. And, yeah, and they really got the the burning of the valley sound uh, just right because that's exactly what. Uh, that's exactly what the British and the Indians were doing in those days, which is how, uh, why, why we don't have Mohawks in the Mohawk Valley anymore, because they were on the wrong side. Yeah. They, and they ended up losing their lands as a result. Even by that time, the time of the revolution, the native population in New York State had dwindled so much as a result of the continuous Indian wars. Yeah. European wars has spilled over here, uh, yeah. through, up through including the French Indian War and the Revolution, that there was wars all along there yeah. because England was fighting France. They were dividing the various Indian right. confederacies right. one way or another. And they've been fighting with each other long before we got yeah. they, uh, they, they had the, uh, the epidemics that came through the state that wiped out uh, Indian communities, yeah. and there was a very hodgepodge, you know, mix of Indians in the state by the time uh, the revolution came, and the revolution split them. You had, you had, the, Mo had uh, the Oneidas and the Mohawks going one way, and then you had the, uh, the, other, the other part of the Confederacy going another way. Well, it's something I learned uh, the other day on, uh, on uh, I think it was on the Amsterdam, uh, I grew up in Amsterdam website, was that uh, the last battle of the Mohawks and the Mohegans took place in Wolf Hollow. Yeah. 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 1649, I believe. Yeah, I mean, incredibly long time ago. Yeah. 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 And, uh, the Mohicans have decided to uh, make one more push to uh, chastise the Mohawks and push them out of what had been their valley. Right. And they came over the Hudson and attacked uh, out by um, the pot that washes itself. Can you hear it? Yeah, thanks. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> first, you, first, you had to translate it from Indian into English, and then we had to figure out what it was. And then, uh, uh, so the Mohawks uh, tracked them back, probably went right through uh, Green Hill, uh, trailing them back uh, through Amsterdam. And cut them off at the pass. They did. They cut them off in that uh, ravine at the uh, Wolf Hollow. Yeah, and we have pretty good details of that battle. Uh, yeah. Uh, all lies on both sides. But that's, uh, <laughs> that's what makes good history. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the Mohawks didn't arrive here until about, what, about 40 years before the Dutch? I mean, it was it was pretty... Uh, they were pretty recent. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were like late 1500s, maybe, that yeah, the Mohawks they, came here. All, yes. all the Iroquois were, had, had migrated to where they are yep. over a yeah. period of several hundreds of years. and uh, They were not the original people. Of, no, no. Yeah. no. Some of the artifacts we're now finding over at that dig, uh, where the pedestrian bridge is going, they're not all off of artifacts, they're earlier wow. proto-Indian, mm -hmm. uh, what they call the archaic period. It's funny you mentioned that we talked about the War of 1812 and the Revolutionary War, uh, the burning of the valleys. There's uh, always an interesting connection for me in a guy named Timothy Murphy, who was key to the Battle of Saratoga in that he's the sharpshooter in Morgan's Rifleman that shoots General Frazier and disheartens the British. But after serving as, a, as a, in essence, like an army ranger, we would say nowadays, he, uh, he leaves the unit and decides to settle in the Schoharie, where he marries a local girl. And then the Indians attack with the British, and he's defending Middleburg. 
And the commander of the fort is a guy named, his wonderful name is Malaktion Woolsey. And uh, Woolsey says, uh, you know, I think we ought to surrender. And Murphy says, no, I'm with my wife in the fort. And uh, three times Woolsey goes to, to haul down the flag. And the last time Murphy says, you do, I will shoot you. I will kill you where you stand. And Woolsey says, you know what, I think uh, maybe I'll just give over command of the fort to you. And, <laughs> and he leaves. And of course he was regarded as, as forever after as a coward. But his son was one of the naval heroes of the War of 1812. Woolsey? Yeah, same name, Malachi on Woolsey. Uh, Jim, could you just go over there and turn this just a little bit toward you? No, I mean toward uh, a little bit that way, a little bit toward Church Street. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. That's, that's it. That's good. That's good. The one guy who doesn't come off good in uh, drums along the Mohawk or Rob, uh, uh, Northwest Passage is uh, Sir William Johnson, our local hero. Well, you know why? He's inside the loss. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm reading a book now called uh, Bloody Mohawk. Yeah. And they, uh, they spend a, a great deal of time in the first section of the book uh, talking about Sir William Johnson and his impact on American history as the, uh, as the agent who worked with the uh, northern tribes as opposed to the gentleman who speaks in my head right now who worked with uh, the southern tribes during that era because they had Indian agents who were responsible for yeah, a different know. section and, and how, how much he had become a part of the uh, the yeah, Mohawk when I wasn't there, I, I uh, community. Well, half of them were his kids. <laughs> were his kids. A couple were his, his friends. Yeah. They worked in there, you know, and, and how he had come over and, you know, basically as a nobody and worked his way up because of his ability to deal with the crown as well as able to, to deal with the na native populations. And the book, it's interesting how not, not unlike today, that there's a, always a clashing of heads between up, up New York and down New York. You know, what the, the folks down in, in Albany and South were looking to accomplish and what he was looking to accomplish and how they wanted him to go about doing it. And the lack of understanding that the Crown had and those in New York had about what, what was up here. You know, originally he came, he came here to uh, harvest the timber to build ships and to harvest the timber to provide tar for the ships. Well, there was no pine trees here, they were all hardwood trees, yeah. so that his ability to do that, well that didn't take long to figure out, so he had to look for something else. So he went into, to, went into hardwood flooring. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, carpet lean started with the song by him. They, uh, you know, and he ended up... Bill you know, Johnson's discount flooring. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still on the south side. I think yeah, it is, yeah. 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 And, and how he, you know, he, he used the fur trade. You know, and how even at that time, the fur trade was disappearing in this part of the country because it had been harvested for over a hundred years by the, the, the French and uh, the Indians of the state who would take their, their furs to uh, Canada because they got a better price. You know, the Brits were always looking to take something on the cheap. One thing, I, you asked what's old news. Um, <laughs> last, uh, last year I wrote an article uh, about Sir William Johnson and of course he came over to the south side and then eventually he moves over to where the train station is now. Uh, and then it goes to Old Fort Johnson and then Johnson Hall. But while he was at the house that was by the train station, he, we have records of the first ever St. Patrick's Day celebration. Yes, and he was, in he was, that's right. Good, good yeah, thing to bring up last year. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know, every time I go down to the Irish American Club, it just doesn't seem to sink in. But <laughs> hey, this is, you know, this is bigger than New York, folks. We're the, the first town, or the first location to have a St. Patrick's Day. Absolutely. And if you read the letters, they were all full of like, uh, oh, we uh, we drank too much last night. <laughs> His brother, I can't thing. Uh, we had too much to drink last night. Too many. Uh, your your oh, options drink. of what to do were, were pretty limited then. You either drink or drink more. Go, which reminds me again of drums along the Mohawk. <laughs> Arthur Shields was so magnificent as the uh, as the preacher. Oh, uh, oh my lord. Yeah, uh, Put, put aside the demon rum. Well, he needs it for the trip. Well, and he turns, he turns his back so he doesn't see it. Uh, you know, doesn't see him taking the drink. One thing I never understood about the movie is uh, Henry Fonda's best friend, the character's name is Adam Helmer. And then you remember the part of the movie where um, Fonda leaves the fort and he's running and the Indians are trying to catch him. Down Dalton, right? yeah. Well, actually, that's based on the true story of Adam Helmer, who, who ran more than 26 miles 
uh, from south of German Flats, where he was ambushed by the Indians, to warn the, the settlers that they were on the way. And literally, what you see Fonda doing in the movie, running and throwing yeah, up, and, and then collapsing into the fort to warn the settlers, that was Adam Helmer. But for some reason, they changed it in the movie. And, uh, well, that was Walter Edmonds. Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. And besides, no, Henry Fonda looked better running than Ward Bond, I guess. So that's probably <laughs> it. Was, uh, you know, it, uh, another thing about that, I, I just love John Ford movies, period. Uh, but uh, but all through this movie are the John Ford stock company. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this, like, crowd of militia coming forward, and I recognize his brother, uh, Francis Ford, who was a, a silent screen actor and brought John Ford to Hollywood, actually. And he plays, in The Quiet Man, he's the old guy who's dying at the end, who puts his pants on to run out and watch the fight. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he's in there, and it's just like, just like passing right, in, passing right through. But, yeah. I always was a big Ward Bond fan myself. Oh, right? uh, you know, oh, yeah. He, yeah. he was in, like, every great movie ever made, doing something or other. Yeah. In fact, when we were thinking of raising, how to raise money for the Veterans Memorial here in town, I had this idea of we hold um, a Ward Bond film festival, because a lot of his movies were about military stuff, and we would sell Ward Bonds. Ah! <laughs> and there would, there would be, there would that's be, not a, bad. There would be a picture, each one, they'd come in different denominations, a dollar, five And of course, dollars. he was in Drums Along the Mall, which right? premiered at the Rialto. So, in the picture, in the middle on the on the bond would be a picture of Ward Bond in one of his drums along the low wall. That, or, that premiered in playing the captain. They were expendable. They were expendable. Or, oh, you, you yeah. just name it, just one after another. Yeah, yeah, and you could buy your Ward Bonds and cash them in at the uh, film festival. See, and that's a big big play on World War Two and World War One, where you sold war, war bonds, bonds, you know, yeah. and, and, and getting the people thinking. Uh, that's, that's a pretty clever idea. We should have to kick off at the Rialto Theater. Oh, no, oh, wait, oh yeah. That's a little late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we would do it at my office, which was... I was going to say, it's upstairs from the Rialto. I was upstairs from the Rialto. Yeah. I'm upstairs from the Rialto. There you go. Yeah. yeah, actually, the center part of Walman's office is the old uh, entranceway yeah, into, yeah, the, into the into where the yeah. ticket the ticket booth is uh, where they keep the computer. I think or something. There. Somebody <laughs> called me at the office a while back asking about if there were any movie theaters left in Amsterdam because they were hoping to come find all the movie artifacts, and I was like, ah, too late. Well, I mean, no, it's not too late because they're see. buried under my parking. Yeah, the uh, there, there's like tons of uh, uh, of. Uh, of old uh, posters are buried under the parking lot when the, when the building went down. They, they stayed. They just left? Yeah. Well, put so there you go. Maybe you'll they were under the stage. <laughs> under the stage. There's a corner of the parking lot which uh, perpetually develops a sinkhole. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they, you know, Paul has to bring in some, bring in some asphalt every few years and fill it up. And that is located just about directly on the spot where Bela Lugosi's dressing room was when he did Dracula live there in the late 40s. Yeah. He did a tour of a uh, tour with Dracula in these old vaudeville houses. And you did an archaeological thing. You know, I was in that play, not the, not the one with Bela Lugosi, but the same 1924 play. And uh, it was hilarious because I wanted, I wanted to play either Dracula. Or Van Helsing. I thought Van Helsing would be good. You know, well, that would be an yeah. obvious. Yeah. obvious yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they'd, they'd, they'd spell your name wrong in the program. Yeah. And, and, but they'd be closer, probably, be closer. just by accident. <laughs> so, and I always like the line, you know, when Dracula looks at uh, Van, Dr. Van Helsing and, and says, You know Van Helsing, for a man who has lived but one life, you know too much. <laughs> and I thought, what a great line for a historian. <laughs> so, but anyway, I got stuck playing uh, Seward. Uh, He's like, there's more lines than anybody else, and everything pivots around it. It's his, it all happens at his sanitarium, it's his daughter, his daughter's friend, oh, it's yeah, his right, neighbor, right, right, right. And, his, and his best friend uh, and companion comes to the rescue. So he's kind of pivotal. But all my lines were nothing but, oh no, you don't mean, really? It couldn't be. And that's all I did for two hours. <laughs> and basically say, no. <laughs> I, I have in my collection uh, a, a wonderful artifact it is the Spanish version of Dracula oh. that was filmed at the same time on the same sets with the same script. But, yes. And they used a lot of the same stock footage. Uh, but different characters playing the parts out. The really guy who spoke Spanish, it was yeah. that dub. But he clearly had seen Lugosi do it. 
and and it's great to watch. It's a little sexier than the other, and it's a little longer. And uh, and some of the uh, scenes toward the end suddenly make more sense when you see the Spanish version because they were just cut out. Uh, in the An editor's floor. Huh? Uh, yeah, the editor's floor. But uh, yeah, my 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 favorite just watching it was uh, Renfield arrives at the castle, and Dracula says. Buenos noches, <laughs> Senor <laughs> Renfield. That, that's that's the other good line in the movie. Uh, of course, there's so many of them. But uh, when Renfield and Dracula are sitting down for their their first meeting, their dinner, and uh, uh, he gives him some wine, and Renfield says, "Aren't you having some?" And the Count says, "No, thank you. I never drink wine. Never drink." What? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it, but I used to have that. Uh, Lugosi could deliver those pregnant pause lines better than anybody in the world. My, my absolute favorite, I think it's the uh, uh, Son of Drac uh, Son of Frankenstein, the, the one with uh, Basil Rathbone uh, playing. It's actually the prequel to Young Frankenstein. Okay. Uh, uh, Lugosi plays Igor in that one. Igor. That yeah, was Igor in that movie. Uh, <laughs> and he's got the rope burn around his neck. And, of course, young, young uh, Frankenstein Jr. has to ask about uh, how, he, how he got it. Uh, and he tells the story how, how uh, he, was, uh, he was being hanged and the rope broke. And under the common law, uh, that was a sign from God that, uh, uh, and, and you were allowed to go free if the rope if the rope broke during the execution. Yeah, because the the execution failed, therefore you're free to go. And he and he says, and why why were they executing you? I killed people. <laughs> they said. <laughs> You know, those movies relied so much upon acting as opposed to a special effects. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. And, and these guys just, they had it, they had it not. I used to have the Renfield laugh down pat. I don't know if I could still do it. But it was very helpful when I was stationed in New York because strange people would come up to the street, on the, on the street to you, and they did, you know, they would leave you alone. They'd be like, you know, they'd want something, like Carrie Christmas or something. But if you could do the Renfield laugh, they would like, well, <laughs> you go, oh, yeah. back right off. <laughs> we had a little problem with our Dracula in the, in the stage. Production. Hey, Scotty. Hey, Scotty. Uh, Scotty. Uh, Scotty. Uh, Scotty. Uh, Scotty. 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 Scotty
but uh, that's where our original water. Uh, they uh, and uh, down Northampton Road too, from the creek on Northampton Road. I, it, I think it uh, fed uh, those houses on the, you know, like Jackson and yep. uh, Byard Street and down that way, uh, uh, all with the, uh, all with the natural spring water. Uh. So anyway, other guys, when we had a problem with our Dracula, our director could never get him to. Uh, Dracula. He'd be like, no, don't, don't do like this. Do like this. Yeah. Or do, don't do like this. Do like that. You know, and uh, I'm double jointed. Right? <laughs> so uh, That's great. Uh, the last scene in the play is in the crypt, Carfax right. Abbey, and we had gotten a real coffin. We had a mannequin, and inside the shirt was a can, a number ten can full of sand, and we were supposed to. Van Helsing and I were supposed to drive the stake in, and off stage. Uh, Jimmy, the uh, guy playing Dracula, was supposed to let out this blood curdling scream when we did it, but he never got it down right. So. <laughs> <laughs> there I am pounding this stick in, and I always off stage right here. <laughs> and at this point, Van Helsing and I just and, that, and that's like the climactic moment. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the stake falls over. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have blood spurring out of it at the same time? No, we never got the blood. We, 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 the blood we couldn't get to work in the, the flying bat in, the, in one of those scenes. It was like a potato uh, spray painted black with the <laughs> prep wings. Uh, he, well, at least once a performance, he get caught in somebody's hair. Oh, and the worst. The worst thing is, once the, the, the trolley, or the pulley got caught, and instead of flying in and flying out and flying in, he flew in, and then he just hung there for the rest of the scene. <laughs> so I'm doing my lines you know, even, in the, like, even in the movie, the, the, that effect is really cheesy. I mean, yeah. you, I mean, it, 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 oh. it, it, where the bat, it just, where he turns into the bat, and the, 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 it, 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 it's clearly on a string. And that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we always have special effects uh, because it keeps my son in business. Uh, but, you know, I was watching uh, my nephew uh, uh, is doing a tale of two cities out, uh, out in the greater Boston area in school. He's a sophomore. And uh, so I got chatting with him on Facebook and asked him if he had seen the Ronald Coleman version. And he says, no, he says, uh, uh, no, I can't get it around here, and you, I'd have to buy it. So I immediately bought it for him and sent it out. But meanwhile, I had my own copy that I uh, that I watched again. And boy, you talk about acting performances. Edna May Oliver again, yeah, doing yeah, like yeah. essentially the same scene. <laughs> uh, you know, she was only like 49 when she died, and she was playing all these uh, older women. Uh, yes. uh, but oh, what? What a great movie! I mean, that, uh, I think it really may be my favorite of all time. I used to get choked up uh, every time I every, saw that movie. Every time, there are several scenes in that movie where I choke up every time. One is the uh, the Christmas Eve scene, the Midnight Mass scene, uh, the uh, the scene where he's talking with uh, with the, with the banker and kind of revealing what he's about to do and. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, and the ancient banker says, uh, uh, you know, I've you know I've been a bachelor all my life. When I uh, when I leave this earth, there'll be no one to weep for me. And he pauses just the right amount of time. Wouldn't she weep for you? <laughs> my favorite part of the movie yeah. is uh, the very end. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you, you you see him going up the scaffold to the, to the guillotine. But you don't actually see the execution. The, the execution, because what the camera does now in modern movie, they they follow the guillotine blade yeah. all the way up, and then they drop it and right. follow and it down, and, and, and plus pull the sound back at right. the same time, just kind of drift the sound. Right. Back. But what it does is, when the, when the camera pans up and you, see, you go to the blade, instead of waiting to see it drop, oh, you continue horrible. up and you see. Paris, the Eternal City, yeah. and I at this point, I, I you know, being a historian, I, early in the movie, I'm like, you know, Jacobins, bloodthirsty Jacobins, I tell you. <laughs> but at the end, it's like, as 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 the camera goes up, it's like, yeah, it's resurrection. The, yeah, life will go on, and, and yeah. the, the excesses of reign of terror right, will end. All right, and, all right. And then before you get to oh, democracy, will but, go forward. Yeah, it, 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 it's brilliant. And, and the uh, the French Revolution scenes uh, are among the best ever filmed, uh, as far as adventure scenes go. You know, the uh, the revolt in the in the poor section of Paris and the storming of the Bastille and the uh, and the 
army troops coming and, and instead of turning on the crowd they turn on the Bastille yeah. oh, and, uh, and, and electrifying electrifying just a great picture all the way around that was a big source of uh, trouble in American politics about that period as to whether we were going to support the French you know we had treaties with them uh, and uh, and you know was this Democrat Democracy to excess. You know, Jefferson was, and, and, and after all, Louis the Sixteenth was the guy who gave us the money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Jefferson was all, all in favor right. of the French Revolution like crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, we, we, and a lot of his supporters in this country were ready to do exactly what they were doing in France and ready to start killing uh, the their political enemies. Uh, and, and that came, it came really close. It was. Uh, uh, that was a, it must have been during the Adams administration. Of course, he, he another John Adams piece of brilliance is when he, uh, uh, what was it the XYZ affair? Oh, hell. <laughs> yeah, he just pulls, pulls that one out. By the way, you might be interested in, uh, in these people betraying your country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's stuck in my mind for two reasons. One is a little kid. Uh, I, I happen to be talking to some friends about things, and I was like, oh, I just read about this thing called the XYZ affair. And they were like, you made that up. And they used to tease me mercilessly about it. The second thing, of course, is that's where the, the famous saying comes from. Uh, Millions for defense, but not a penny for a tribute. That was the way we did business. Yeah. So we, and it was actually in, in the military. They call it the undeclared war with France. And we actually, the Navy has a little streamer for it. You know, I, I sometimes forget how fragile we were in those first years of, of the nation, betwixt and between that, the Barbary pirates, the Second yeah. American Revolution War of 1812. Yeah. How. You know, it could have gone either way, and we could be well, it, something entirely different now. Uh, you know, Absolutely. few few people remember that that uh, toward the end of uh, Adams' administration, he uh, it was so close to war with France that he uh, that he uh, reconstituted George Washington to uh, to gather an army, uh, and Washington came back to active duty. Uh, and then he died in the middle of it, and it was almost his death that that, that diffused that the situation because because Napoleon was such a huge fan of Washington's uh, that that all of a sudden the tension between the two countries went away, uh, and he had every flag every flag in France uh, yeah, draped in black crepe in, in memory of Washington. Yeah. Of course, in a few more years, uh, Napoleon had uh, taken over and. Uh, at, at this point, uh, you know, was interested in selling us Louisiana because he needed some money to fight the Brits with. And that's right, it could have turned. Yeah. yeah, it could have turned. We couldn't even get, we were so weak, we couldn't even get the British to honor their treaty obligations after the revolution. And they were still manning their military forts. Although. I'm still waiting for them to pay for their World War One debts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Calvin probably, Coolidge was once asked uh, whether uh, he was in favor of a movement in Congress to forgive uh, the British war debts, and a as only he could do in so many words, he said, they hired the money, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> but they still haven't paid. Uh, uh, William F. Buckley Jr.'s uh, uh, first foray into international politics uh, came at the age of like eight when he wrote a letter to the King of England uh, demanding that uh, we're going <laughs> to pay us. Yeah. Yeah. We know they're good for it. Yeah. That was the second time around when we told him before you, 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 you get anything, we get you know, bases and you know, they came yeah. up with a concept of lend lease so that it wouldn't be like we're getting it and not getting anything back. Right. So Don't walk speak. away, blah, blah, blah. Well, when it was over, we didn't want anything back. We we're, were blowing everything up. <laughs> I found a found an article in my research uh, about the the Bikini Atoll operation, mm -hmm. the atomic dropping, the testing of the atomic bomb. Uh, Bob Sice was there, by the way. Judge Sice was. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, son Tom said to me one day, he says, you know, uh, I'm one of the few people who can say I actually met somebody who's witnessed the uh, dropping of an atomic bomb. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, there were there were articles about how many billions of dollars worth of equipment were were being blown up because we were getting first of all we were getting rid of the entire Japanese Navy what was left of it 
and a good good chunk of our own yeah. because we didn't need it anymore. And, and you know, you like me some wise voices pointed out, oh, yeah, we paid. We may have paid a hundred billion dollars for this equipment, but it ain't worth nothing right now. So. No, 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 no. Yeah, at the end of the war, Just they were giving everything away. Right? My father told me about uh, his last duty station was in Charleston, South Carolina, and, and it had been a port of embarkation, so every officer going through there had to pay dues to the officers' club while they were there, yeah. part of shipping out. So they had like $100,000 left <laughs> in the officers' club, and all these, all these officers are reservists, wartime officers in charge of the club, and they were like, you know what, we're not going to leave this for the regulars. After the war, so every night it was like luau's, picnics. <laughs> they hire boats to take people back and forth, just trying to get rid of the money any way they could. Yeah. yeah, my brother was on a hospital ship right after the war. He said they had tons and tons of uh, clothing that they just burned. He says that, that all the sailors wanted to take some of it, but they wouldn't let them. They burned everything that was left over. Yeah, the military is always strange about that stuff. I mean, I uh, well, Army Navy stores were very popular for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had one down here. In oh, I had them everywhere. Yeah. I had them everywhere. Yeah. yeah, And there really was just tons and tons, tons of surplus because yeah. we were kicking it out like crazy. Yeah, I used to go to Fonda every weekend to the the surplus store up there to get the, all the electronics that I could see what they had. Yeah, it used to be a great way to spend time as a kid. You'd go in one of those places, look around. Yeah, look around all those mud bands. Lots of canvas. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, lots, lots and canvas. lots of canvas. Yeah. yeah. Lots of tents. Every Boy Scout troop had that, plenty of plenty of oh, government yeah, surplus tents. They, 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 my my turnout like with all the tents up there. My turnout gear when I was on the fire department was uh, Air Force uh, pants. Yeah, uh, pilot's sure. pants because they were insulated, they were hot, you know, they were warm. Little did we know that if they caught fire, you were done. <laughs> well, right. Well, those were the days. Yeah. Wow. Well, we had enough? I think we had a great one. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. And tomorrow at 2 o'clock in Albany, we're on the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And the Irish American Club will be serving corned beef uh, sandwiches all day long uh, yep. tomorrow, yep. and uh, I'm sure well into the evening. And you can call ahead and order them. And you can call ahead and it order them. It can be delivered. Them. It can be delivered today if you today, like. Today's yep. delivery day. Yep. Which is Friday, but uh, I'm sure it will deliver tomorrow. Yeah, Tim Riley was on the radio yesterday talking about that. Right. Well, yeah. There you go. Yeah. One of the other stations, not ours. Not this one? No, not this one. All right. Okay. Okay. Very good. Our special guest, as always, Robert Van Hasselen. We're going to have to put you on the cards pretty soon. That's right. Uh, Jim Nicosia, Gavin Murdoch, who has been on every single show but still hasn't on our, uh, isn't on our card. Uh, we're going to have to take you your out, You didn't run off. out of cards yet. You didn't run out of cards yet. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been the show with no name, and we'll be back next week. Right. Maybe. That'll be All uh, things Ides, of Art, Ides of March plus eight. Plus eight. And this has been the show. With no name.